So, hi everyone, thank you for coming. It's an intimate crowd today, and my name is Lawrence Pisano, and I am a resident of Southboro. And today I'm gonna to speak as a representative of SOLF, or the Open Land Foundation of Southboro, and talk a little bit about the wildlife survey that I've run the last two years uh, here in Southboro, Massachusetts. Um, the title of the talk really focuses on three major aspects of this talk. So I think most of the goals of these types of surveys, and this one in particular, is to engage local citizenry, local uh, folks in the area, to explore the resources they have around them. So to go outside and actually see what's underneath the log and see what, you know, what's out there and to gather data and actually do real science, gather information, collect uh, numbers, and use it to help drive education and conservation about these resources. So um, when we use the phrase citizen science, that means folks that aren't traditionally trained in science can go through a training process as we have today. We have some of the uh, volunteers that have gone through that process for this project uh, tonight. They can actually go through the process, learn about the proper scientific ways to collect empirical evidence, not just, oh, I think I saw uh, a snapping turtle last Friday or, you know, four years ago my dad saw a, a cobra out back, you know. We actually want real evidence and go through real techniques to be able to, to make the most of, of the area we have. So um, feel free to stop me at any time if you have any questions. And uh, you're also welcome to learn more about the Open Land Foundation through solf.org. So I'd like to start by talking a little bit about the Open Land Foundation, or SOLF for short. If you'd like to learn more about the organization and its mission, you can visit its website at solf.org and uh, learn more about their um, procedure. So in general, I took a little snippet from their mission statement because it does apply directly to what our wildlife survey se seeks to do. And it focuses on preserving, protecting, conserving, and enhancing the natural resources of the town of Southboro. And I think that, in a sense, gets to the, 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 crutch of the, the, the crux of the idea of conservation. So as of now, they own 17 properties and 181 acres of space. And they're Southboro's own local uh, land trust, which is seeking partners in land protection and nature education. And one of the themes that I'd like to sort of leave you guys with at the end of our talk today is I'm looking for partners too. Um, as part of this project, I'm seeking to train more individuals and get more folks engaged in this um, objective and to gather more data. Uh, and it doesn't just have to be a person interested in going out and gather, uh, gathering data. If you're not interested in actually getting out in the field and collecting numbers, you could work with me to help develop curriculum. We're looking to put together more lessons that engage students of all ages and get them outside in, in gathering numbers and in, in reaching levels of understanding, as well as uh, local researchers. So I've worked already with Framingham State University uh, scientists or herpetologists in sort of sharing their data with me and vice versa. And so these are good examples of, of individuals and folks that can be involved in the process of conservation, exploration, and education as well. So in case you're curious, a little bit more about me, I'm a Boston native. I grew up in West Roxbury which is a small town in Boston. I, I went to school in the Boston Public Schools, and I've been a resident in Southboro for seven years. And uh, I've been in research in various capacities. I've worked on fishing boats. I've, I've gathered data from wetlands and um, desert uh, ecosystems in California. Um, I've been a graduate and secondary school educator for the last 15 years. I'm currently employed uh, in a Boston Public School. And I've published several articles and curricula dealing with uh, marine biology, animal ecology, their locomotion, how they behave and interact with the world around them. I've also published some curricula with institutions like Tufts University and University of Cincinnati uh, dealing with biology concepts in zoology um, uh, education as well. I have two daughters in Southboro Public Schools. They're uh, in kindergarten and second grade as of next fall. And I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to work with such great, uh, motivated, passionate, committed individuals who have given up a lot of time and energy to commit towards this cause. So um, they're not just folks showing up with you know, sneakers and shorts and saying, hey, I'd like to touch the animal. They are literally down there picking up rocks, gathering data, pouring rain, sweating, bug bites, all the good stuff that comes with field work. So, I, I, I'm grateful for that, and I thank those of you that have been involved with that, and I look forward to, to more experiences with new folks as well. So the 
three major areas I'd like to focus our time on today is a very, very brief case study introduction where I'd like to give you guys some information, uh, a certain case study, where uh, you can try to determine the identity of a particular organism and what seeing that organism and experience its presence, experiencing its presence can actually tell us about your responsibilities as a scientist in a, in a conserved area or in an area in general and what you should do, how you should respond and how you should um, follow up those observations. I'd also like to um, go through a seasonal breakdown of how open space at the Beals Preserves is used by the term is herpetofauna. Now herpetofauna is just a fancy way of saying any non-plant animal based organism that is, includes reptiles and amphibians. So um, herpetology is the study of reptiles and amphibians and that will be what we use as our model to really work out the best way to run a sample like this. Pardon me. And you kind of have to work out the kinks. Every area is different. Every ecosystem has its own unique set of challenges. And so a lot of the kinks that we'd work out in this project, and we have over the last couple of years, we could apply to studying organisms beyond herpetofauna. So plants, animals, um, fungi, you know, other groups that we ne aren't necessarily studying. We are uh, censusing other species other than reptiles and amphibians, but at the same time, we're going to use those as a model. And I'm going to end the talk by offering suggestions on how the data can drive goals beyond exploring an ecosystem. So how can we use the data we collect to advance objectives in education and conservation? Um, for those that aren't in economics, SMART might be kind of new to you, but SMART goals, and some folks aren't necessarily a fan of them, but ultimately we want to initiate responses or, or some sort of usefulness of the data in a timely fashion. So SMART goals are specific and they're measurable. We do want to make sure we have very clear ideas that we're testing with data, and the goals are achievable. I'm not going to say, okay, all traffic anywhere near a vernal pond or, or Beals Preserve has to be shut down. Obviously that's not an attainable goal, that's not realistic. But there are things you can do that are realistic that might help improve the, the success or likelihood of a creature um, to be able to survive, replicate, and, and go on into the future. So let's try our, our case study. Here's where things get extremely technologically advanced. Okay. So this is sarcasm here. So let's say, let's say you're in your family's yard and you see this mass, and I, I apologize, it's a little dark, the image is here, but you see this mass and you hear this sound. Big pudgy fingers. All right, ready? So I'm going to pause here. What, what do you hear? Ducks. Ducks? What do you hear in the back? <laughs> chickens? Okay. All right, chickens, ducks. Miss in the front? No? Nothing? Frogs. Okay. Frogs? Well, if you see something like this, what do you think these are? Eggs. eggs. And these are actually frog eggs. So if you kind of compare some of the um, other eggs we might see in areas like this, these are toad eggs. They almost look like ramen noodles. That would be like a great uh, image. Um, they're not. Don't eat them. But perhaps there's some delicacy I'm not aware of. But don't. And these are bullfrogs. And they tend to be darker, um, which is convenient because of this picture. And down here are the eggs that we, that we saw earlier. Now, these are actually the eggs of a wood frog. And wood frogs are very typically identified by a sort of a quacking pattern, as, as the gentleman in the front identified. They sound like ducks. And it kind of seems a little bit weird and atypical that something like a frog would sound like a duck, but it does, and it's a very key identifying factor, um, a feature of this particular organism. So the, I say these the eyes of a bandit because if you look underneath the eye, and it, you might be able to see a little, the dark eye shadow here. This is not an emo individual. This right here is uh, a wood frog. And wood frogs are very strong red flag of a potential need for conservation. Now, the reason for this is, and this is an intimate group, but gather around. I'm going to tell you a story, um, an evolutionary story. So let's go back to some period in time where you had some ancestral group of, of frogs. And they're doing OK. They're doing great. But for some reason, the frog population breaks up. And one group of frogs goes in one direction. One group goes in another. And one frog 
through random mutations and ad adaptation, ends up finding themselves really well suited to a particular body of water that doesn't always stay full year round. Sometimes it gets dried out, sometimes it's full. But for whatever reason, this group of frogs does well in this area. We, we call these vernal pools. And another group of frog does particularly well in ponds and other ecosystems. Now, it's useful. It's really useful for a critter to do really well in these vernal pools. Because you might say, well, if they're going to dry up, what's the point? They need water. Why should they stick around? Well, the beauty of a, of a vernal pool is that since it does dry out, it's really poor quality habitat for fish. They just don't live there. You don't find fish in vernal pools. And so one of the reasons why these critters do so well is they lay lots of eggs. But even if you lay lots of eggs, you're really at risk of fish coming in and eating them or other critters that tend to like to do so as well. But if those risks aren't there, you might do so well. You might do really well. Um, unfortunately, these habitats, since they are seasonal, they're often unnoticed and underappreciated. And so these vernal pools tend to be uh, missed, or they tend to be polluted, or they tend to dry up, or they tend to be developed over. And so since these creatures, wood frogs, Jefferson salamanders, marbled salamanders, and other creatures that are threatened and of special concern, since those creatures only reproduce in these areas, instinctively they only seek out these areas, they're, they're called obligate reproducers. They only seek out these areas and reproduce there. They just instinctively avoid the others. And so if these areas aren't identified and these areas aren't recorded, they can be developed over and they can be removed and these species are particularly threatened. So I'm going to ask you guys if you have something to write with. I didn't tell you that would be work to do, but if you have something to write with or a pen or a paper, okay, we'll assume that you do. <laughs> oh, for seven. But I'll write this information down and I'll make it available for you if you're interested. But there is an organization called um, National Heritage. And if you Google Mass National Heritage, um, and I'm not going to ask you or expect you to read this, but if you if you track down the National Heritage and Endangered Species Program, or NHESP, and you notice there's an area called vernal pools. And if you, if you think you heard the quacking sound, or you think you identified frog eggs that look like this, or other species that are uh, indicators of a vernal pool uh, lifestyle, and you click on this, you can actually do what's called certify a vernal pool. So you can go on Mass Heritage, you can upload Latin long and other relevant information as well as photographs and things like that, and you can identify that particular area. And this could be just something that looks just like this in your backyard. I was house hunting about four years ago, and I saw two homes that both had vernal pools, neither of them were identified. Now, the challenge is, I didn't own those homes. So if I went on the vernal pool and I identified, oh look, there's a, there's a marbled salamander, and I uploaded it to Mass Heritage, I could be sued for trespassing because it's not my property. And so the challenge, especially in, in local, some of the local development projects, is that these areas that do potentially have potential vernal pools, they, they can uh, document it as no vernal pools have been documented or something even more um, creative, no endangered species or threatened species have been documented in this area. So have there been? No. Has a study been done? No. So what you have control over is your land. So you can go and you can identify those. And, and that, among other reasons, is my justification for this project. So I'm a, a very, very passionate individual when it comes to wildlife. I want my daughters to appreciate it. I want their friends and their children to appreciate it onto the future. So I really was excited about uh, proposing this project to the Open Land Foundation. And since they share a lot of my passions, they were agreeable to it and they've accepted it. And we've since collected two years worth of field data and have a lot of raw data to work with and have a lot of uh, very passionate and excited volunteers that are continuing to help us collect more data. And so what the goals of these surveys are, are first to, to model sampling techniques to quantify land use. So we want to know what are, oh, thank you everyone. That's very nice. We want to know. How are, how are people using the land? How are, how are citizens using the land? But more importantly to this survey, we want to know how animals are using this land, how species are using. Since we're not going to try to quantify every single species at once, we're just going to focus on the herper herpetofauna. And we're going to clarify the ecolog ecological and conservation role our properties play for local species. Again, when I say our, I mean the Open Land Foundation. They own 17 
um, distinct properties. And I want to know how are the land masses being used by all reptile and amphibians. Um, in particular, I'd also like to invite and inspire families and institutions to explore and appreciate these resources using a spectrum of technologies. So some people just don't want to handle the creatures. Some people do. Some people would prefer to take a really cool picture, tweak it, upload it, and share it that way. Some people might like to do what I did and download an app that will allow you to share certain sounds, certain calls, and learn that way and say, oh, that was the sound that I heard. Um, a, a, friend, a friend and I were at a, in a fire pit and we were listening and we heard Barack! and we thought we had definitely heard some sort of exotic dinosaur. We were convinced <laughs> it was some sort of carnivorous raptor and it was, we were going to document it, but in actuality it was a gray tree frog and I, we were able to confirm it through something like this. So whether it be uploading your pictures to Facebook and having a real rich dialogue with other volunteers about what you found and why it was interesting, or just kind of exploring the land with the folks around you, these are, these are ways that you can explore these resources. There are other really great things that I hope to do in the future with uh, local researchers where we can potentially we can tag individuals and see how they travel across the area. Two years of data has shown that we have in, in very intensive uh, activity levels after rain. Some days we've recorded as many as 115 frogs moving through a certain sample area in one day. So this, and this was even without recapture. So it's, it, clearly there's a lot of activities, a lot of traffic, and um, we, we may need help with really gathering some great data. And I'd like to partner with local like-minded groups and individuals to help re reach our goals. So whether it was the Boy Scouts of America, or uh, local universities or other institutions. We really can we use the help and also share, share some of the pleasure of, of visiting an area like this. So in particular, I'd also like to see how fragile species are using the land. So if we do end up finding fragile species, we have, for example, documented wood frogs in the area, but only a couple and only younger individuals. So the question is, if they are younger individuals, are they moving from a vernal pond outside of the property and migrating through to find resources? Or are they actually hatching from a nest, suggesting there is a vernal pool that hasn't been documented on the site? So are they using it to mate and reproduce, or are they just using it as a territory, a hunting grounds? So that is one goal. Also, is it a critical resource? In other words, are they only using this and only this resource to do their thing? Are they only using this vernal pool? Now, that type of question is tough to answer with the type of research we do. Sometimes you can use genetic assays to track down specific population allele frequencies or, or specific genes and specific numbers you only see in that particular group. So that would be something we'd have to reach out to outside um, investigators for. Um, also, just how well can programs like these engage local citizen scientists? Do we have to freshen it up? So the last couple of years, we've been looking at uh, activity in, in, in land use by just seeing how much they move over a particular distance in a sampling area that I'll show you in the next slide. But maybe by switching things up and you know, maybe we collect data this way or that way or that another way, get feedback from you and then actually uh, modify the way we collect data and that can engage uh, more energy, encourage more exploration and foster education. So I envision a, a situation where you know, we're not studying everything. We made observations, very preliminary observations of what tadpoles are in the area, but maybe an eight-year-old really excited about tadpoles wants to get in there and say, well, wait a minute, how many of those tadpoles are bullfrogs? Are they other species? What if I do this? What if I, what if I apply some of the STEM skills that I learned in my after-school program my daughter's seven and she does an after school program where she builds rockets and she builds other things. Maybe a student will want to build some sort of collecting device that's not invasive, that's not harmful to the critter, that catches the critter uh, you know, t temporarily. They can gather some data and release it. I'd like this to be sort of a breeding ground for education and conservation um, work outside of this project um, in the classroom. Get kids out there and actually apply some of the skills they're learning from some of the great programs our schools offer. So how did we approach this? Well, a little over two years ago, we identified an area really close to an ice pond on the land. And, and I'm, well, I'm, I'm certainly willing to take folks around the property and, and show you what we have. But about 30 to 40 meters away from the, the ice pond, which is over here, um, we dug out 
uh, six openings and we buried right to the soil level uh, five gallon buckets you might pick up at Home Depot. And then we took about a hundred feet of aluminum flashing, about two feet tall, and we set it along the length of a zigzagged it over a hundred foot distance. We also took a uh, six foot area, two by three feet pieces of plywood, and we labeled them and laid them out over 200 foot distances in an area uh, of, of re, uh, reimagined uh, conservation land called a whip area, which is an area that's been, um, that's been changed to foster activity from certain types of breeding birds. And so we laid them out there to see if we'd have any reptile activity. Snakes really love on a hot day climbing under here where it's nice and warm and cool, uh, cool and, and uh, moist rather, and we wanted to see if we would see activity from reptiles under here. And then we went through a very informal training. Now informal in the sense that you know you could come after after work or on a weekend, but formal in the sense that we really wanted to make sure that their data had integrity, scientific value. So we would train individuals on the proper way to handle some of these critters. Here's a critter that had fallen in one of the five gallon buckets and this person is trying to identify species here. Um, making sure not to wear any sort of sunblock or, or bug, uh, bug repellent that could get through the skin of the, of the amphibians. We brought in professionals and experts um, or experts in the uh, identification of snakes and, and other critters so that they could help share some of their expertise with volunteers. We also had scale representation so we could uh, document the, the presence of these critters and some of the species that we found as well as some of their dimensions. And um, rain, rain or shine had folks come out and learn more. Um, it's challenging, especially with smaller individuals, but we also helped, look, helped volunteers look for clues as far as identifying gender. Here's the, uh, here's the vent of a female garter snake. Uh, action shot, there's a tongue right there. But as you can see, the, it's a slow tapering body length, suggesting it's a female. Um, it's a little tough to see in this image, but this is the, the cloaca, or the opening of a, of a um, male spotted salamander. And so in the springtime, right before they're ready to mate, their genital openings get swollen, and you might look for that to identify males versus females. Um, there are great resources online, like this image here, where you can identify. You'll need to know this later. Quiz, quiz clue here. So um, you can identify the difference between, say, uh, green frogs of particular gender. So if you ever pick up a frog, especially an adult, and you want to identify its sex, you can actually look at the diameter of their eardrum, which is external. This is a tympanum membrane, or tympanic membrane, or tympanum. This, the diameter of this is in the male is larger than the eye, whereas in the female it's actually smaller, as the male is projecting sounds, as you heard with the, the, the wood frog earlier. And they're also kind of wanting to know what the other guys out there are doing too, so that they can establish um, breeding grounds. And so um, there are lots of resources that are available, and through trial and error, we, we tried to identify uh, gender differences. Come on in. Um, we also tried to look at what's called population density. So using, and you can see an example over here, um, using a controlled area, we looked at two-dimensional representation of uh, surface along the, the substrate of the floor, the forest floor. And what we tried to do is say, OK, in particular weather, we, we notice migration patterns to be pretty aggressive after rain, let's say. But what's actually hunkered down in these particular substrates? So we train volunteers, and we will do one of these types of uh, data collection surveys a week from this Saturday, so June 4th, for folks here in front of me and folks watching at home. Um, you're welcome to come on out to the, the Red Gate cul-de-sac, and we'll be meeting at 10 a.m., as we'll, I'll mention again later, to do one of these types of data collection. And the interesting uh, phenomenon you tend to find in the Beals Preserve is for every square meter of land you look, you'll find at least one redback salamander. That's an incredibly high population density. And so this actually compares pretty favorably with the literature for other areas, suggesting that we have um, a really nice population density of at least redback salamanders. And here's one that's been unearthed that we could compare there. So if we all have some paper and a calendar, I want to sort of quickly summarize what we've found. So that way, if you are interested, starting next March, or at least starting now, all the way to the end of the field season, which is usually about the middle 
towards the end of October, depending on the weather. I want to show you what creatures we've found and when you might expect to find them if you're out walking around in the Beals Preserve. So the first picture, I, I, I apologize, the lighting doesn't do it great justice, was taken by one of our, uh, one of our audience members here. Um, this is a great image of a spotted salamander, and this is a really well-documented um, picture because it shows length. We usually, the standard norm is to measure distance from the tip of the nose to the vent, and so this was about a nine and a half to ten centimeter individual, a large male. And so one thing we're noticing is that is the yellow, is it potentially, is the yellow spotted salamander potentially the first to the party, so to speak? So early in the, in the season, around the middle of March, yellow salamanders start to be the first types of, of herp, the first species to show up, potentially because of their hardy size and their, you know, kind of early nature to get, to get going and reproducing. So typically, if you're interested in seeing a beautiful yellow, yellow spotted salamander, you might want to come out to the preserve over by the edge of the ice pond around the middle to end of March, and you have a pretty good shot of seeing one of them. You may also see one of these individuals too. This is the, the red back salamander that we, I showed you in an early image, earlier image covered in soil that we dug up from the substrate. These folks tend to show up a little bit later, um, but not much later than the yellow spotted. They show up around the, towards the end of March, and they stay pretty commonly in the area until the middle to end of April. You may see them sporadically buried in the substrate, but they're not, not usually active beyond those uh, relatively cooler months as they do try to stay moist and, um, and wet during the season. They're particularly fit. As you can see here, this, is able, this, this critter here is able to move a pencil with its own body, rolling it up against the force of gravity. Um, it, it can't, but it's fit in the sense that it's really good at reproducing. And these are one of the ideas you don't necessarily understand when you're a student. I speak for myself and my uh, high school students that I teach in Boston Public Schools. You don't understand the concept of fitness, about being a dominant species, a cosmopolitan, very present species, unless you get out in the field and you make these observations. Almost every time you look under some leaves or look under a rotted trunk of a tree, you see a redback salamander. They're fit in the Darwinian sense. They lay a lot of eggs. They produce a lot of offspring. They're very indirectly competitive. They're good at, at getting the job done. They're good at reproducing. They're good at getting resources. And they displace other species that may not be as suited to a very human-influenced area. And so these are ideas you don't necessarily see unless you're out there collecting data. And so here's another image of, of the redback salamander. And you can see it, 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 adults tend to reach somewhere between 5 to 7 centimeters um, in, in the field. Now you'll notice the lettering, this represents the bucket we found it in. And sometimes, and I can always share brighter images with you if you're curious about its clearer image, sometimes you see an, an individual like there that lacks that red back pattern. This is called a lead back salamander, and they can often be confused for other salamanders. I know I did it the first year, I confused it for another more uh, threatened. Um, species, and I think I let my excitement get the best of me. But that's the beautiful thing about documenting your imagery. Um, you can corroborate this. We uploaded this document to Facebook. I thought, well, if we found a, a great species, I thought perhaps it might be a, a Jefferson salamander. I didn't realize uh, upon closer inspection, this has a much more traditional toe pattern and size of a redback. And, uh, you know, I was very excited to go on to the Vernal Pool site and upload it as an, as an artifact, et cetera, et cetera. And in reality, it was another phenotype, another physical feature of a, of a species that you tend to see. Um, I see you're nodding your head. You might remember that term from biology class. But the, the beautiful thing about this also is that you start to see variety. Charles Darwin said, you know, the, the driving force of evolution is variation and something that's paying off that allow you to reproduce more than your, than your other varieties. And so this lead back variety is one that's doing just almost as well, at, you, could make, you might make the argument, as the red back. And it, it shows how your DNA doesn't necessarily always show one particular form when it's translated. Um, we also see the four-toed salamander. And this also looks very much like a redback, but it has a more gradual tapering of the tail and a white belly, as well as four toes. You can kind of see the fourth one fairly well here. We, um, going back to your calendar, you probably see the four-toed salamander about the same time you'd see the redback salamander. Um, wait. Do you, do you guys hear something? <laughs> I, I, feel like I, I feel like I hear something. Do you guys hear something? 
What's that? What's that sound? You may have heard it a lot actually the last few weeks. Does anyone know what that sound is? This is a pretty standard call that you might hear driving home from work one night. I know I, I used to, with my first house, I used to take a left off of Woodbury, I think what's called, I'm bad short term memory, but I used to take a left off of uh, Route 9 and I'd head into Southboro and I would, you could hear it if your windows are down, you could hear it on either side of the road and it was very typical call of a, of a sp uh, spring peeper. These start to become pretty active around the same time that the yellow spotted and the red back. So if you really want to hear some um, spring peepers, you may want to drive with your windows open on a very uh, quiet night like this one when you go home tonight. Um, open up your windows and if you drive down, I believe it's Woodbury that connects from Route Woodland. Woodland, thank you. Woodland, only lived here for a few years. Um, <laughs> if you drive down Route 9 and head down Woodland and you just park about maybe a quarter of a mile up, pull over to the side of the road, you'll hear them calling pretty well. And you'll hear them at, at the ice pond in um, the Beals Preserve as well. Um, you also hear, you also uh, hear something like this, and this is, you can tell, this is my, my daughter's uh, nail polish right there. Um, anyone want to take a guess what this is? All you can see is it's relatively calm head. You want to take a guess? It's Kermit. Every, every presentation, every presentation I get that. Yeah, this is definitely a bullfrog, and they start to become a little bit more prominent towards the end of April, early May, or at least I've found so far in um, the, Beals, the Beals Preserve. Uh, in particular, June and July is where their numbers really start to pick up. Um, they, they're definitely a common species, and so common that there is a little bit of confusion about what this species is relative, and a lot of folks tend to think that this is also a bullfrog. A bullfrog. And in reality, if you listen carefully, you, we can actually hear this call when you press the right software. Has anyone heard this sound before? It's almost like a banjo swing, plunging on a, uh, plucking on a string, it's like a don't, 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 as opposed to Well, the difference between these are, this is the, the second sound you heard was the green frog. And so one of the really, really cool um, experiences a young volunteer gets, and an older one as well, is this sort of observation that they make themselves. They think they came up with the conclusion, and, oh, and then they start teaching their friends. Like, no, oh, no, 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 no. You, you, you want to look at the dorsolateral ridge. Might be the biggest word they've used that day. The dorsolateral ridge from the eye down towards the leg is what you'd use to separate the green frog and the bullfrog. And what gender is this? Male. This is a male. Pretty large uh, tympanum, tympanic membrane, suggesting that he's probably the one doing the calling and listening. So great experiences uh, might draw people out. And when you do it once, I've had volunteers ask, well, what, when's the next time? Let, let me try it. Let, let's do. So it's a, it's a great program for that reason as well. Um, here's another ex uh, species of snake. And this was the, the first and only example of a milk snake that we found uh, under one of our cover boards. Now, just finding one promotes a whole dialogue on, the, on Facebook or in, in conversation. Well, why was there only one? This is a male. This is, a, does this, is this the male's territory? Is the male moving through? I found a skin. That means the male is relatively healthy or at least is recently shed. Um, you know, what is it about? Why, why aren't we finding the same population density of milk snakes that we are of garter snakes? We've been finding garter snakes pretty much every day from the end of May all the way to the end of the year. So what is it about garter snakes that makes them better suited to the area than milk snakes? Garter snakes are what a lot of folks call a cosmopolitan species. They're very common, they're very agreeable to human influenced areas, and they're very good at what they do and they can establish themselves and their numbers pretty well. A little bit of digging into a milk snake, a milk snake's ecology might find that their particular uh, requirements and their particular behavioral aspects might not necessarily jive with the type of environment that um, we've established. Even an open land area, even a conserved area, has a lot of impact from outside sources. It's not very far from a road system, from a uh, little outflow of the Sudbury River, a lot of areas that are very much human uh, impacted. So these are other questions that students can ask. 
Um, but the really interesting question is what other critters are out there? And so we've seen a lot of diversity in frogs. We've seen wood frogs. We've seen uh, pickerels, green frogs, bullfrogs, peepers, gray frogs, as you'll see later. We've seen a lot of frog diversity, but not necessarily a lot of snake diversity. So the question isn't necessarily, are they there? It, the other question is, are we doing the right s sampling? Are we using the right sampling techniques? So cover boards are great, but are we putting them in the right location? We've avoided whole areas because of how much livestock uses the area or how much poison ivy is in the area for the sake of our volunteers. Um, I mean, I figure you just get them some calamine lotion, they can suck it up and get back out there. But, you know, we want to keep them happy. But all kidding aside, I mean, we, we always want to establish dialogue and try to figure out, like, what can we do better to gather better data? And also, this is clearly a, a younger individual. Now, ring snakes don't get that big, but at the same time, it's kind of interesting that we have younger individuals, if these are indeed maybe a one, uh, a neonate or a one-year-old individual. Um, so if we are finding younger individuals, like that wood frog we, you saw earlier in the palm of that person's hand, that's a young wood frog. So that suggests that they haven't traveled very far or haven't, uh, you know, maybe more recently left their nesting site. So that could offer some clues that we're actually brought up, in this case, we're brought up on the Facebook page. It was like, wait a minute, this is a small individual. Maybe there's a nest nearby. Maybe there are more individuals. Maybe this is a new immigrant to the area. So um, these are great conservation questions to answer, um, to consider, and to test, especially if you're trying to figure out how the area is used. Remember, one of our big questions was, how is the SOLF land being used? In these techniques, these research methods that we apply here at SOLF, uh, by solve at Beals, we can apply to the other 16 properties. And some of you in modified form can, can you know, do them as well at home to try to figure out what you see in your own backyard. Um, in, in the classrooms can do it as well. Now, we are licensed by the Division of Fish and Wildlife to do these studies and to capture, quote unquote, capture animals, although we do release them back into the wild. We also made arrangements. We were obligated and required to make arrangements with other institutions if there were mortalities or deaths in the process. And there have been um, three or four individuals that, of, the, of salamanders that we've confirmed and, and um, a couple of individuals of frogs that have passed. But we use them for educational purposes. And we, we try to make sure to do that. We, we want to make sure that our research is done responsibly. And I don't want uh, people to conduct the research irresponsibly at home. Um, but at the same time, it's something to consider. Um, turtle populations have been um, studied as well, to a degree. We could gather more data. Um, this is a man-made pond, so I would imagine that, the, turtle, that the, the pond is being used as more of a migratory location. I haven't seen much evidence of, of nest laying or, or anything like that, but that doesn't mean, or egg laying in nests, but that doesn't mean that it hasn't happened or that we've definitively ruled that out. But what we do um, like to do is try to, to label the individuals so we can keep track of them, try to notice their movement patterns, and try to um, identify individual, new individuals. It may be hard to see in this image, but the, this long claw formation is usually pretty typical for males, as males have an extended claw length that they actually extend out to the female's face, and they kind of tap the sides of the female's face to stimulate egg laying. Uh, or receptivity to, to sexual reproduction. So that is a good indicator that this was a male. Um, very civically aware at an ALS support that was uh, pretty popular two years ago. Um, I also found that by doing this, I not only could identify this individual later when we saw it later, and in in this nail polish comes off. Um, it wasn't really a color that worked for me anyways, so it was a good thing. But um, it also avoided me getting having to dump ice water over my head, which was convenient too. Have seen any other painted turtles? We have not yet seen any evidence of a species other than painted turtles. We've seen anecdotal evidence that there are snappers but again, haven't seen them, they haven't. Snapping turtles are usually, when we did look for evidence of turtles, we set um, traps that are cylindrical in shape and have mackerel or other type of really oily, smelly fish as a base. And so the oil dissipates out and diffuses out into the water source. And then usually a very aggressive uh, snapping turtle would actually go and, and you'd see either uh, them in the, in the pot if they're there, or the pot totally disassembled as they try to get at and, and rip apart. So um, we didn't see any evidence of either. Doesn't mean it's not there, but um, we haven't seen evidence of basking. They are uh, ectothermic, so they do require the sun's energy and heat to, to keep their body temperature regulated, and uh, just haven't seen any observations of those. But 
we're always uh, looking for better volunteers with better camera lenses to get really up there if you see any basking evidence to, um, to record it. Um, we're always interested in talking to neighboring uh, families and institutions to see what they're seeing so that we can kind of corroborate what they're seeing and perhaps look for those similar species um, as well. We've seen garters as many, as many uh, folks would expect to see in the area of all ages and all genders. Uh, reproducing, um, we've seen, I've seen evidence over by the lone wolf trail of neonates, newborn individuals leaving nests so that the entrance to the upper meadow, which uh, it, you're welcome to grab maps on the way out if you'd like, but the entrance of the upper meadow leaving the lone wolf trail area, there's a rock wall that, uh, that forms a sort of a, a right angle, that I believe is, a, is a, either a hibernating or a nest la an egg laying site where a lot of young were leaving the area. I saw two or three go by the toolbox last, last summer. So this could be a, a good site for other snakes. I did also see the, in roughly the same area, I did also see the milk and we saw the ring neck there as well. So that was a small individual. So maybe they're competing for uh, nest laying sites or nest building sites. The bullfrogs are also common, I mean the uh, American toads are also common in the area, and uh, gray tree frogs. Those you wouldn't expect to be super active close to a pond, but they definitely prefer those types of habitats and they can be found in trees as the name suggests. Uh, their numbers, if we go back to our calendar, um, in June and July, this time, um, about a month from now, we should expect a little bit more activity of gray tree frogs. They, tend to, they were noticed in our site both uh, at the beginning of June, and the snake activity starts to pick up towards the middle of June, end of June, but we could see snakes on really warm days as early as uh, late April, early May. Um, the bullfrogs, again, I said June and July, but the, the toads, we started to see become more active towards the end of April and into June. So it's always a good idea to keep track of the prime times to go, early rainfall, uh, middle, middle summer rainfall, et cetera. Um, it, was, it was a species that was fascinating to the younger children in our group. This is, my, this is a younger picture of my daughter about two years uh, ago. And they don't move as much as some of the other uh, species. Their, their skin pattern is very typical of the color of lichen. And so their strategy is sit in place Maybe the, maybe the challenge will pass, um, or I won't be noticed at all. And so I noticed a lot of, a lot of children just stopping and, and just looking and wondering, like, well, you know, why is this not moving? Like, why, you know, you could read about it in a book, but actually observing it firsthand and then coming up with your own questions is a critical part of education because it's your question. You're excited about it, you're going to pursue it, and you're going to want to maybe engage into some research or observations to learn more about it. And then if you're, you know, maybe you reach out to a parent or a friend or a teacher for more information, but it's yours. And then that fuels a lot of additional research. Um, prickle frogs and leopard frogs um, would be expected to, see, to be seen in the area. Um, haven't seen a lot of evidence, maybe two or three sightings of pickerel frogs, but they tend to spend a lot of time in the pond. So by, by their behavior, documented behavior, they call in the pond, they're hanging out in the pond. So you may not hear them calling as much. Um, in fact, the calling is a lot of it's underwater, so it's interesting to note, you know, that that's the case because you may not be popping, uh, they may not be popping up sound-wise in some of our audio recordings. So, dredging the pond and actually getting some direct pond data is a, is a really uh, critical part of this project, and we might want to pursue. So, since I don't want to have an exclusive uh, Herpetofauna virus uh, bias, rather, um, there were some other interesting finds. Um, some slime molds here. Um, I was fascinated. We found this little distribution of reddish orange fungus looking structure and I guess that's a particular type of protist, an algae type uh, relative that doesn't have the characteristics of a fungus. Um, also some, some other interesting beetles, some interesting berry formations, um, lots of interesting spiders, even some uh, crawfish in the, in the, uh, in the pond and this is a winter leaf caterpillar, I looked up. Um, and so a lot of interesting looking opportunities for photographs and, and observations. Um, I think it's a, it's a fascinating diversity that we'll find there. So um, the factors that might explain what we're seeing or what we're not seeing. So a, a lot of volunteers ask, well, why aren't we seeing water snakes? 
You know, why aren't we seeing rat snakes or queen snakes? Or why are we not seeing, you know, newts? Or why are we not seeing this? Or why are we not seeing that? That opens up all sorts of opportunities for ecology discussion. The abiotic fa factors like weather and, comp and biotic factors like competition. What do they have to do with what we're seeing? But also, I'd like students to be able to on their own say, well, wait a minute. That, that flashing that you set up for the buckets, this, it's up a little bit. You know, maybe if we plug that down with some debris and some mud, maybe we could keep some traffic going directly in our buckets where we want them to. Or, or maybe we should sample here or do it at this weather or that weather. Um, also, biologically speaking, there are four major uh, factors that can help us understand why we are and aren't seeing what we see. First, habitat destruction is an obvious one. Um, it may seem that when we set up our home and we establish a nice lawn, it's a, it's a nice lush area for creatures to thrive. But in reality, the diversity of that area, the, the number of species in that little pluck of land is quite low. In, especially if you're adding herbicides and other substances to keep the lawn looking lush, you may actually be establishing a really inappropriate set of conditions for creatures to thrive in. Um, introduced species, it's kind of an interesting question. So painted turtles aren't necessarily indigenous to all parts of New England and Massachusetts, and a lot of painted turtle populations are the result of released pets. So these critters are particularly good at establishing themselves in an area, and they may also be very good at competitively excluding other species from gaining a foothold. Um, the pet trade may have also led to um, over-exploitation. Some species may have been caught and in, in sold as pets, um, maybe removed from the habitat. But I think the main reason that a lot of our species aren't thriving in the area is uh, a disruption of interaction networks. So that's a fancy way of saying we once had a, a, a habitat or territory that was of a particular area or square footage, and it's been bifurcated. It's been cut up by roads or by uh, man-made uh, water systems or by home development or something that's breaking up the area and preventing them from going from, say, the place where they lay their eggs to the place where they get their food, to the place they do their mating. And it just makes it difficult for them to migrate from one location to another because you may not get everything you need by the pond. You may have to go near the tree for your nesting material. You may have to go over here to get food. You may have to go over there to find a mate. So disrupting these networks are particularly challenging to an individual uh, species in its population. Um, often snakes are found on the side of the road basking, trying to warm up after a long day because the road has still radiant heat from the sun and they can absorb that sun's energy but they often are dark in color because that helps with camouflage and you may not see the animal until it's too late. I, I very often see roadkill on the sides of the road of snakes um, and a lot of the amphibians like salamanders and frogs. So since these um, interaction networks are broken up, we often see what's called a, an extinction vortex. So basically, if your population is quite small because you've broken up the population and you've separated it into smaller groups, often there's inbreeding or drift of genes going in and out of uh, popularity or out of number or frequency. And since the, the genes are going down in their number, the, the variability of those genes or the genes that help and don't help start to become lower as well. So do you remember I showed you the picture of the redback salamander pushing up the, the uh, pencil? And I said, that is high fitness. Fitness, again, is how well you and your genes do in an area. Well, if you don't have very good genes because the variation of your genes is poor, then you're not going to do so well in the area. You're going to reduce fitness. And then you may be more likely to die and less likely to reproduce. If that's the case, you start spiraling to an even smaller population. Now, let's think very broadly generally. If you don't have great variation, great genes, where can you get them from? Like if your group of frogs don't have great genes from another, from another area, well if you can't get there because you're over, you're, you and your great genes are here and a road is here and here's the population that needs your genes, there's an issue. And if you're not making it easy for critters to get from one population to another, you can, you can slide those individuals down the vortex. Uh, and we see this in a lot of research. Here's an example of a, of a Swedish project on butterflies. And here's a part of the northern islands of Sweden. And all of these areas here, the blue dots, 
represent a strong population of butterflies, the red dots represent a relatively weak, and the clear white dots represent where butterflies used to live but now do no, no longer do. And it's a constantly fluctuating situation where this area may have butterflies at some point, but now currently doesn't, but might get butterflies from the red and blue areas to repopulate the area, to immigrate back into that area and replenish. Now butterflies can fly, so they get around a lot of the issues that uh, more land-based critters uh, struggle with. So studies have shown that all of these populations may belong to one species of butterfly, this species here. But the strength of that species lies in the ability of genes to what's called flow or move from one population to another to strengthen a relatively weak, and weak population at one moment in time. And I think one of the issues that a lot of our populations of reptiles and amphibians are struggling with is this exchange of variation starts to become difficult. So the exchange of genes. Now you have these populations living in an island. You know, 56 acres is what Sulf, I believe, uh, has within the Beals Preserve, which seems like a massive amount of land. But for critters that might not necessarily say, well, I'm going to sit myself right smack dab in the middle, if they're near the edge and they're not able to come and go, um, they may be on an island of lacking variation and may be going down that vortex and just not able to get movement of, of, of genes um, from one area to another. So anything we can do as a society that's sustainable, that's, uh, that we can help critters in their genes to get in and out of an area would be very useful. And that does include being careful of how you, how you drive, for example. So, um, what are our long-term goals for this project? Well, again, as you can see, exploration, education, and conservation. That's really where we want to focus our attention over the next few years. And um, we're always looking to form new partnerships. So if you go to solf.org, you're welcome to, to, to become a member. Or you can reach out to me in the project, and we can, um, I can train you and get you involved in the data collection. I'd love to have more folks involved. Um, I do want you to appreciate the open space, as well as corridors. Corridors are the scientific term for uh, the ability or, or pathway a creature moves from one area and one population to another. And so what we can do to connect some of our properties or to interact with people that own land or properties in between might help establish corridors to allow movement of genes or of individuals from one area to another that could be really useful for the species as a whole and for all species. Um, I do want collaboratively identify or develop student curriculum that weaves our data, STEM skills, uh, science, technology, um, engineering, and math skills, and critical thinking to new, engaging, and rewarding educational experiences. So get kids outside and have them use their phones, have them use their apps, have them use software, help them, help them use even traditional methods of data collection, and really start thinking about how they can be active members of our, our preservation uh, culture. Also, develop smart goals for local land um, and species conservation. So in other words, I would love to build a bridge from the one vernal pool on one side of woodland to the other side of woodland. A nice little arching bridge. It can be architecturally beautiful. But I can't imagine that project's going to happen. But we do have uh, road brigades that are announced on Facebook sites that advertise, hey, the weather's becoming rainy, we're getting to a point where it's like very optimal for migration of, of critters. Here's a wood frog hoping desperately, and doesn't didn't really hope, but trying to get from one side of the road to the other. We notify people, we have them come out with raincoats and flashlights, and we help guide creatures across the street for like a few hours of your night. It's really fun, you can go with your children, you can go with your friends, and you know, if we get there soon enough, the mortality rate or the rate of, of roadkill really drops significantly, and we have a lot of success. And we can help bring the meta population on one side, let's say, of the road to meet the meta population on the other and exchange genes. And that might help that, crit that critter last a few more years. Um, this, is, this is an example of an activity that I've done with my students that helped them use the what we call a quadrant, a four-sided um, assessment of, of what critters are using. We practice with common lawn weeds, um, broadleaf buckthorn plantain, dandelion, clovers, and we have them lay down quadrants and the groups break up, even large groups. A lot of, a lot of teachers struggle with um, maintaining control of their class or if you have 32 students in a class, like how do you engage all? Well, 
32 goes in, you know, 4 goes into 32 really well, 8 groups of 4, that's 8 sets of data. We can extrapolate it out the whole lawn, and we've got a great assessment of what the population density or how many of certain weed species are found in an area. And then you could say, how would you look for salamanders? You could apply it right, right after, the next day. Come on down. I'll meet you at the Beals Preserve. We'll, we'll figure out how to do this. What do you think we should do? How do you think? What would you do if, you know, like these types of questions, how would you do this in a pond? How would you do this in a tree? I feel like Dr. Seuss. But still, <laughs> these are ways that you can gather data. You don't need a degree to do it. Citizen science is a rich avenue of data from one project to another. So it's very, very important to, to carry that out. Other things you may have heard about, but um, if you want to do your best to, to make your lawn more habitable or your land more habitable, sometimes spreading wildflowers in an area helps create a landscape in a little plot of land that might be really great for pollinating insects and ultimately really good for herps like salamanders and frogs. Um, be careful with your use of the sides, pesticide, herbicides. Um, these, are, these are chemicals that can easily move into the skin of an animal or if they go, into this, they go into the liver or the organs of, say, a food source like a cricket, and you're a frog and you eat enough crickets, you get every single portion of those chemicals for every single cricket, and then it accumulates in you. And every time it moves up the food chain, um, as Rachel Carson taught us, um, you know, it can have a big impact. Um, car idling, just turn off the car and when you, if you need to go in. Um, if you have any leaks in your car or in your... Um, or in like something that you use at your home to deliver like uh, fuel or things like that or a, a gas canister or something like that. Anything you can do to avoid that getting into. Um, also, keep your pets indoors. Cats can, can take out five or six uh, birds a day depending on how active they are in their area. Um, they can take out frogs too. They can take out anything that they notice. Um, they're great animals. I love cats. But at the same time, um, you know, you have to be careful. If you're interested in adopting an animal, you might want to vet the institution, make sure that they're responsible in the way that they collect the animals. Are they raising them themselves? Are they, are they gathering them from the wild? Um, I, we have a hamster at home, and we adopted it from, um, from an adoption um, angel memorial in Boston. They, have, they had hamsters up for adoption, and we made sure that we took them from a home that had donated them. Believe it or not, you can adopt hamsters. I didn't know. So um, yeah, and keep your, keep your pets uh, leashed whenever possible. Um, so some of the partners that, um, that we've worked with so far, uh, the, the Boy Scouts of America have worked with us to keep some of our land in a state that's easy to use. Uh, Boston Latin School for housing some of the, the, the organisms that were unfortunate um, mortalities in this, in this project. Uh, the Division of Fish and Wildlife for our, our uh, permitting and Framingham State University. The New England Herpetological Society has had men members that have volunteered and helped um, gather data and identify species and the library for this presentation. Um, I just, I'm excited to have folks get outside and explore open land. Um, to learn more about it, to learn more about educational, uh, ecological phenomenon, and to, to sort of get more and more involved in conserving some of the great resources we have and learning more about what's out there. So if you're interested, thank you for your time first of all, but if you're interested in our next data collection will be a week from this Saturday at 10 a.m and the Beale, at the Beals Preserve entrance at the Red Gate Road cul-de-sac, which is off of Flag Road, which is off of Route 30. So you're welcome to come and just dress for weather and tick prevention. Thank you. Appreciate it. Any questions? Sure. Um, I have, I am in an environmental science class right now. Great. And you may have been like talking about it earlier, but how, like, what would be the best way for my school to get involved? Because I sure. have some interest in. I can just give you my, let me just give you my email address. So um, if you're ready, it's uh, L as in Lucky, okay. and my last name is Spazano, S P E Z Z A N O, and it's at Boston Public Schools, one word, dot org. You're welcome. And you could also, um, if you go on to solf.org, you can, um, I think it connects to the, our Facebook page. Um, we have a group page. Um, and then there's trainings and things like that if you'd like to be more involved as an individual. Thank you. Are there other training dates besides that June 4th? Sure. Yeah, I'm very, I live very close to the sampling area. So I, I, can, I can be flexible. We've, in the past, we've done 
uh, after work session. So for me, I, I leave the school around 2.30, so I'm usually in the area by 4. Um, I, I'm responsible for my, my daughter's pickup from school, so some days won't work as well as others, but I'm pretty flexible. We can, we can work it out. Um, but usually I try, I'm going to try to stick with, with um, alternating Saturdays. I think that might work best for, for most folks' schedules. I might just pop in a Sunday here and there just to help other folks like that. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. This is not a question, but it's a, a comment because we live near wetlands. Yeah. And we have a very active snapper. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're aggressive. They're very good I know. at laying they were, But there's, it's so interesting because we've lived there for 15 years, and mm -hmm. every year it's kind of around this time they migrate from our the stream to the pond mm. at same that's why I was like I'm like we're a road brigade because when we see the snappers when we live on a cul-de-sac so I'm like be careful stop mm. um, and we see all sizes we've, we've had little um, they lay eggs in the, yep. the mulch and yeah it's amazing I mean they're good they're good at they're fecund so they can lay lots of eggs they can build big nests um, and they grow fast so they can size wise outcompete other critters for resources and they're noticeable so that might be a feature I'm not sure how it's much it's studied but that might be a feature that allows them to be less likely to be hit by a car or you know bothered by a development project or something like that because their people see them and they can they can avoid them as opposed to like a, a box turtle that you know it's very small dome shaped it, it's very hard to see they don't move very well um, you know maybe maybe perhaps they're more likely to be impacted by road killers or something like that. I have a question about sure. that. Because we notice them in the springtime going to the pond, mm -hmm. but we don't notice them coming back. It's like they're another pathway. <laughs> they go back over <laughs> way. I don't know. It's a good question. I don't, I, I, there could be. There could be another pathway, or they could just be there longer. Um, I don't it's think. Definitely age, because they, you know, there's giant I don't know if there's like a a time pattern like if they if they go back during at night and they go during the day like I, I don't I don't know that's a it's a good question hmm. and so you pick the Beals Preserve because oh good question so um, it's it's the bigger portion of land of all the other um, uh, properties so I felt and it also has a huge variety of, of ecosystems so there's a man-made pond the, the pond that has I thought would have a lot of activity there's also um, and and uh, you're welcome to grab one of those um, those maps on the way out. But it shows that there are there are meadows, there are ponds, there's uh, pine base uh, forest, there's uh, maple base forest, there's uh, viney areas on one side. There, so the diversity of of ecosystems is very high. So I thought, you know, if I, I could see maybe this set of organisms here and that set of organisms there, and then maybe some migration from the pond. Then there, there are rock walls that go through the area, which is a great basking site for snakes, egg laying area. Hi they hibernate over the winter, so it could be they get down into a, an area of that rock wall. They might be able to stay there. Maybe we'd see a few dozen of them coming out in the spring. Um, so I just I thought it offered a lot uh, more a lot more diversity in the area. Some of the properties are close to roadways, so I'm not I hate to be pessimistic, but I'm not optimistic. I feel like those islands are narrow. Uh, you remember we said before how each of the populations are kind of isolated, so I feel like once they leave, they, they don't come back, and their likelihood of coming back are slim, so um, I wasn't optimistic that I would see a lot in some of the properties. That doesn't mean that they're not there, because uh, they could be repopulating. I just, I, wa I was more optimistic I would see more diversity in that area. It's, it's also the most accessible yeah. piece of property mm -hmm. to solve homes. Yeah, you can get there from, I think, two different cul-de-sacs and what other side roads. Five different access points. Mm, that's useful too. Um, yeah, so it's funny because I learned this the hard way. I was, I was playing frisbee in college and someone threw me a frisbee and it went into the woods and I dove after the frisbee into the woods and I dove right through a patch of poison ivy. Like, and, I, and it was, even though I learned about it in the book, I realized I could be in the middle of the woods and I would never see poison ivy. But when you get closer to what's called an edge, Habitats change quickly as you get, so a lot of people think, oh, I've set aside this amount of area, the size of the chairs, for these, this population to thrive. But really, the pop, what those critters need is maybe only around those four chairs. And as you get closer to the edge, 
the landscape changes, the tree, the tree types change, the plant type change, the acidity of soil changes, how much humidity there is. So they may only be able to, what's called, they may only be able to realize, it's called like a realized niche, they only may be able to use like this portion. And now all that's available, it's like, you know, conservation land. But in reality, you've, you've basically, it's like, uh, you know, if you, when you're cleaning up a spill, and you, you wipe through the middle of it, because then the edges start to get, a, they're a little drier on the edge, and the edge will it'll evaporate faster if you cut the spill in half. Like the same thing happens with, with land. If you, if you cut it into pieces, and it sort of evaporates in a sense that it, it's, it's more quickly being eroded and the edge starts to creep. In like the example of the poison ivy, they only, they do really well on the edge because they, they have access to sun, and they're not being covered by bigger trees over, overhead. So. Um, yeah, so I, I expect, I, you see a lot of that, you know, in some of these habitats, too. Good question, though. Hmm. Yeah, there are a thousand directions we could go with this project. That's what's so excited, exciting. As I, I feel like, you know, every day I'm like, oh, I wonder if, and, I, and I've, I have conversations with volunteers all the time where they're like, oh, did you think about doing this? Like, why didn't you see that? Like, and and I, I actually, I made a PDF of, like, all this dialogue on Facebook that I was going to share, and I was like, well, maybe I should just not do that for now. But it's great conversation, like, well, what do you think about this? Is it that? Is it this species? So yeah, it, it, there's, it, there's all sorts of opportunities for learning and research in this type of property, in this type of project. This sounds, forgive me, sounds terrible, sounds very novel, but, and this really matters. <laughs> it really matters, mm -hmm. beyond the, just that it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. It matters because why? Like, what the, if this niche, or this didn't, if these animals couldn't survive, mm -hmm. what it, does it mean? Oh, you're asking me. Are they you're saying you're making a okay? No, so, I'm telling you, I'm it's telling it's it's big. So, ultimately, okay. ultimately, when you when you go to an area and you, uh, a, a scientist when they look at an area and they look at the flowers in the area, they can say, oh, I wouldn't expect to see that type of plant in the area because it prefers a certain amount of phosphorus. So, if they see that plant in the area, they could say, oh, that area probably has a lot of fertilizer runoff from a local farm or a lot of waste runoff from livestock. And that's it's putting a lot of phosphorus in the area. And now that area can gain a foothold and everything else is ex excluded or uh, displaced. So when you go to an area and you see a lot of some species or another, you can make inferences about the health of the area. So if we lose certain species, it can have a ripple effect on other species. But it can also be an indicator that the, the land in general is not in a healthy state. So these types of projects in, say, uh, the loss of a species or the gain of other species can offer clues into the general health of the land as a whole. So um, if you have a particular species in an area and it's taken away, well, other species that depend on that species may not be able to be as successful. So um, if you, there might be a certain type of mammal that digs holes underneath the rocks, and then when that animal leaves, another animal comes in and uses that hole as a nesting site. And so if one animal's gone, now you've lost two because they sort of set the stage. They put a footprint in that the other one could take on. So, um, and if you're not seeing other species, that could, be, that could suggest that maybe the area has you know, too much acidity in the soil or has too much of a certain toxin that's building up in the area. So they're good clues of the area's general health, too. And so far, is it too early? in the data collection to make any? No, I think, I think we can make some pretty compelling cases that it's a, it's a very, very active area for a lot of frog species and a lot of salamander species. I feel pretty good about that. Um, it's definitely a well-used area, I could tell, for, for painted turtles and um, other types of, of snakes as well. But I wouldn't, be able, I wouldn't feel comfortable without a little bit more data to, to make a, a, a holistic inference about, you know, this is exactly what this area is being used for. Because, you know, I think 80% of the, of the property we haven't, we haven't studied yet. So there's still a lot more to see and a lot more to do. Do snakes have a territory in which they cover sure. routinely? Yeah. They, they do. Yeah. You know, like rabbits and foxes and coyotes. Yeah, you can see all sorts of great classical ecology papers where they put a transmitter in the snake and, you know, they have like a little telemetry device and, and they, they watch it and they form these large diamond patterns where they're going over here and they're going over there and they're roaming back. And it's pretty tightly centered. And when you look at, say, the pattern of one snake versus another versus another, it's like these overlapping 
stones. It almost looks like a, a bluestone patio where you see there's a little bit of overlap here, but not very much. And so you think there's actually competition? Yeah, oh yeah. Really? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd, and I'd love to do that. There's very, there, there are some really great ways to track individuals that aren't super, it's not super invasive, um, where you can track and, and, and monitor. And I can see really cool real-time websites where you can go, you can log on and you can be like, oh, there, there was Snake A, and the kids might call him George, and then like, oh, look, there's George over here, and there's George, oh, wow, George went over there, and what happened to Mary? What happened? Where did he go? You know, like, oh, we can find him. And, and if I, yeah, and then, you know, what's that? I know, we, we hope that wasn't the case, but, um, yeah, I mean, that's what you were saying before about um, other projects with uh, Wolverines. You know, one of the, uh, the, uh, the area, the, the community starts to become very uh, associated with that. They start to become very interested in the individuals and they want to know. And they, they'll check their Facebook page, they'll check their email, and then they'll check the telemetry study to see where, you know, where, you know, Ralph or Mary, the, the, the um, milk snake is. And it, it helps you understand things like territory usage and, and migration patterns. Is there a rule of thumb size of territory? For it depends on the species. Oh. Depends on the area. Now I read that the uh, bigger males, smaller females. Is that the general rule of thumb? I, I read last year that the uh, study was done with bullfrogs and green frogs, particularly bullfrogs. They said that roughly 70% of the diet of the bullfrog were immature green frogs. 70%? Yeah. Do green frogs predate on other frogs? Yeah, and I, and I just taught this subject in my, in my biology class. Um, there, there's definitely a bouncing back, and if you imagine food webs and the arrows going from one speed, like they can go both ways. So uh, tadpoles can be consumed by other tadpoles. Tadpoles can be assumed, uh, consumed by smaller species of adults. Uh, smaller adults of one species, adults can consume the other. So yeah, it, it, goes, it goes back and forth. The top, the top of that food chain would be the bullfrog because it basically eats anything it can walk. Yeah, I believe they're pretty general. By. They're very generalist. Yeah. They, they can okay. do a wide range of stuff. Yeah. But I don't know how much, to what degree, other frog species. Okay, well, I'm ready to call it a day. It's been a long day for me. But thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being here, and uh, have a wonderful day.